Friends, welcome to Eyes Wide Open with me, your host, Lawrence Eastman. Today, I'm joined by Gary Fong. Uh, Gary has been a practitioner of Zen Buddhism and Karate for over 40 years. He's a, a multi-instrumental musician, uh, a Bachelor of the Arts in Pharmacology. He's the inventor of the Light Sphere, a dome-shaped light diffuser that sold over a million units worldwide. He's also the author of The Accidental Millionaire, and now he's a screenwriter in Hollywood. But... How I found Gary via his YouTube channel is the main topic of today's discussion. Gary has done probably one of the best presentations on Project Stargate, the CIA's deeply classified operation into time travel, psychic warfare, and the men who stare at goats. Gary Fong, the man with nine lives, welcome to Eyes Wide Open. How are you? How are you doing, Gary? I'm doing great. How's sunny Canada? It's really beautiful right now. We just turned into springtime. They lifted the mandates on pretty much everything, except we can't travel. We can't travel between anywhere in Canada. I can't jump on a plane or a train or anything. So, um, so there's that. But uh, I've been talking to a good friend of mine who lives in Shanghai right now. And, um, yeah, it's uh, we're lucky. So, Gary, how I found you... Um... I was searching the internet for interesting things and I stumbled across a document that I believe was released by a Freedom of Information Act in 2003. I think that's what it was. The CIA made public a document about Project Stargate and it was only discovered on the internet, I think, in uh, 2013 by a TikToker. <laughs> uh, so I found this document and it's the CIA talking about time travel remote viewing and astral projection and a number of other amazing ideas as if it's true it's a subordinate making a report to his superior and it wasn't meant to be public and then i found your videos or on youtube or your series of videos it was in which you endeavor to explain the esoteric nature of this document now how you interpret it through your own knowledge and skill set and experience i just thought it was really really good and a great primer and a really good insight into what the hell this document is about so gary fong can we time travel yes the thing about time travel is you can observe different times but you can't actually be there um you can observe them but when you're actually there you're present to you. We're going to talk about time and space in a little bit later, um, but when they say time travel in those really cool like movies that show you going back in time and preventing the assassination of Lincoln and, or whatever that might be, um, that doesn't uh, actually happen. What you can do is you can peer into the hologram of all events that have ever happened in the universe past and future, and you can observe what happened, but also different effects of different changes in course. There's a, a countless numbers, numbers of things that you can see, di different parallel dimensions, different outcomes from different choices that you make. All of that is able to be seen through what some call the Akashic Records. So in Hollywood movies, it's always a test of a director of how well he handles the use of time. And there's been some there's been some brilliant time travel movies in the past. My favorite being uh, Back to the Future, and I thought Robert Zemeckis really dealt with the whole concept of managing time very well. You know, but in the case of the CIA's investigation into time travel through Robert Monroe's work at the Monroe Institute, so are you saying that time travel is possible? But it's not like Back to the Future where you can go back in time and you can change events and change future events like a butterfly effect upon various timelines in the future. Because in Back to the Future, he comes back and he's got a completely different life in the future. So are we more like observers of what happened in the past and what may happen in the future rather than participants? Well, there's not only the observation of what happens fictionally it, it can't happen but we can observe the different eventualities like if i turned right on this road that will cause another set of vibrational energy transfers really what events are they're just basically transfers of energy and what is energy it comes in the shape of vibrations 
So when you start to pulsate in a certain direction, you then start to push out ripples in a completely different uh, direction, which you can observe through the uh, holographic viewing. In fact, I was asked to uh, write a movie about, I don't know if I talked to you about this, the movie called Man from Torad. Um, the time travel movie was actually brought to me by a producer at Paramount. And um, it was a true story, and this is really actually very captivating. It's about a, uh, Japan, a, a man who wound up in the uh, Tokyo airport. I think it was 1946. And he had a sheaf of papers to present to the custom authorities. One of them was his passport. The interesting thing about the passport was from a country named Torred, which does not exist. Um, so the immigration, they, they said, we don't know what this is. They opened up their visas with stamps from different countries, including Tokyo uh, International. Then he had money. He had coins, all from Torred. And he was very angry that nobody knew what Tor it was. And they asked him on a map, you know, point out where your country is, and he pointed to Andorra. <clears throat> now, this is actually a true story. So what wound up happening was they took all of his papers, his currency, his coins, and he was mad as a wet hen, because he's like, I can't make my own coins. I can't mint my own coins. What are you doing? And he said, well, we can't let you into the country unless we have valid paperwork, which yours are not. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you on the 10th floor of the Tokyo Hilton, and we're going to just have some people come down and inspect your documents. So they put the documents in a the safe. They put him in the 10th floor of a hotel, and then they brought in some officials to take a look at his documents. They opened the safe. The safe was empty. They went up to the 10th floor but with no egress whatsoever. The windows were sealed shut. He vanished. Any sign of him vanished. So there were a lot of witnesses that saw him there. So this is 1954, Tokyo Narita Airport. So I was tasked with um, the assignment of writing a movie. And I remember when I told the producer, I said, you're just explaining something that was weird that happened within the course of an hour, and you want a movie on that. And what happened in that is in the writing of that movie, there were so many things that came in synchronistically and through what I call the ability to see, um, you know, the universal vibration. The I'll keep calling it the Akashic Records, but the realities that were brought forth. Like, do you know why there were two explosions in uh, Japan when one could have done it? Okay, and they were three days apart. Now, you can look this up. There is a man... Um, who survived both. He was literally at ground zero of both um, the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he survived them both. He saw the parachute come down with a Hawaiian uh, bomb and everything like that. He worked in Hiroshima. And then when the whole place blew up, he drove home to Nagasaki, where he reported for work. <laughs> He was the luckiest unlucky man in the yeah. world, or the unluckiest lucky man in the world. He gets both. He wins both awards. Well, the thing that I found in writing that movie, and the movie is finished, is that the reason there were two bombs was because over Hiroshima and Nagasaki was because underneath both cities was the Mitsubishi shipyards. And underneath the shipyards, they're able to build the... Um, underground, really amazing uh, structures to hold a lot of people. And then so when they blew the place up, they told the press it's uninhabitable, it's dangerous for the next 10,000 years, you can't go near it. Did you know the Geiger counter, uh, Geiger counter was invented for World War II? That was an interesting thing because they walk around and go, that's not how radiation works. Radiation comes from a point source of radiation like a cathode ray tube or a x-ray tube or a flashlight or a, a spotlight, it doesn't hang in the atmosphere. Radiation doesn't do that. It's a flux of energy, of photons, right? So basically, in the movie, the thesis is that they were both blown up so they could get to the gold 
that was hidden underneath the shipyards. Yeah, and so who would have thought that? They, they were really trying to find the Japanese hoard of gold, and I didn't know about the Nagasaki and Hiroshima story, but I've heard the story where the Japanese were uh, did stash their gold or at least some of the gold in the Philippines, and the Americans were looking for the gold. That was one of the main motivations for destroying Japan, so the Americans could steal the gold. Yeah, it was called Yamashira's Gold, and the reason why they came up with this narrative of background radiation being dangerous mm -hmm. is they wanted to be able to dig it out without watchful eyes. <laughs> and so, you know, you wonder, when you see that, and you put it all together, and then you look up, it was Yamashiro's gold. Okay, he raided. He raided all of um, Southeast Asia, stole all the gold and everything, and everyone wanted to know where he was. When Japan knew that they were about to go down, then it was kind of this handshake agreement. This is what my movie says: handshake agreement between the United States and Japan. Like, we're going to take this over. All this gold is there. It's our gold. So we got to find a way to get it out. And they built these compounds underneath the Mitsubishi shipyards that were like full-on underground cities. Mm -hmm. And they could do that simply because it was a shipyard. Nobody would know when you're putting things underneath because it's such a big thing. So um, a, lot of, a lot of really cool facts come out of that. And, um, and that's where a lot of my information comes from. I don't do a lot of reading, and I certainly don't watch the news. Um, it, it comes in streaming, mm -hmm. uh, exactly what they're talking about in the CIA document about a full ring convergence. Tell us a little bit about the CIA document itself. Some of the, you know, the, the facts, some of the details that we can give to our audience and an introduction into what it is and how it came about. And then tell us a little bit about how you found it and uh, your story with the document. Yeah, we'll do. Um, so the CIA document was a pitch letter, basically, um, from a lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General, I think, and uh, McDowell, brilliantly written. I mean, it was almost like, where did he get this information? He got a number of things wrong, which I'll explain, but he got a lot of things right. And um, so as I read it, I thought, wow, this is so fascinating because the army is trying to weaponize psychic ability yeah. and he literally in this document he's pitching to his uh, superior commander can we make a division or put some resources into this ability to weaponize soldiers so that they can have this ability to become the psychic soldiers and the idea was one of the quotes was one uh, soldier in hemi sinking can take down an entire infantry single handedly if he's able to hemi sink. Uh, how was he able to do that? Because I know that the men who stare at goats is a reference to the CIA documents, and the, the main premise of the film is um, uh, they were able to generate enough psychic power that they could stop the heart of a goat. And if they could stop the heart of a goat, then they could stop the heart of a man. Is, is that how you're explaining that it, it could be weaponized? Um, actually, men who stare at goats got a lot of things out there, but they kind of steered things in another direction. It was, they, it was like a, a mockery, wasn't it? I think it was trying to uh, disparage the documents or the research about the Stargate project. It really tried to turn the Stargate project into a bunch of idiots. You'll remember Jeff Bridges, and they're all dancing and, and doing weird stuff. Um, one thing that is not said in the CIA document is what exactly constitutes a soldier weaponized by psychic ability? And is it that I can just go like that, I can kill a goat, I can melt a tank, I can, you know, make nuclear bombs blow up in their silos? That's not what this was about. The CIA document was proposing the ability for these um, psychic people to enable to their brains to have superpowers of being able to see. If you really stop and look at it, it's all about remote viewing, out-of-body experience, time travel, 
those are all so it's espionage really isn't it it's like a sophisticated espionage that's exactly what it is it's not said in the document it just says that we can use this as a way to have a military advantage let's talk a little bit about those then because remote viewing is something that really interests me i've had to go at it a few times with some success with me dad and, and with my wife there was one time that i did remote viewing with my father and um, he was in another apartment and i told him to pick an image on the internet and really concentrate on it you know and uh and what i did was try to draw it from the other end and i've done it a few times but this one this one was absolutely bang accurate and he had a picture of the liver birds that he was looking at and I drew the liver birds. But what was really interesting about it is that my drawing was at the same angle as the photograph. It was just a random picture and it was the same angle as the photograph. Now I sent it to him at the same time he sent me the picture so that there was no cheating and he was blown away, I was blown away and it was definitive proof for us. You know, um, so I did quite a bit of research on remote viewing. And there's lots of books about it from um, from people who were in the Stargate project. And as you know, it was a CIA project that was funded to the tune, I think, of um, $25 million over 20 years. So it was a very serious project. And um, Ingo Swan is one of the most famous psychics to come out of that project. And he trained up a load of other people who are still around today. They're doing courses and training and stuff. So remote viewing is something that works. It's real. And it's agreed in that document that it's real. Anybody can do it. You don't need any special powers. You've just got to put the practice in to get the results. And that's what I love about the CIA document is it talks about how to access that ability to see. Um, the story of Ingo Swan is certainly remarkable because, as you know, he'd be in a room and they would show, like, a, you know, a village or a town and he could sketch it, whatever, whatever they're doing in the other room. But then his ability to remote view, which he's really known for, became very expanded. And um, it's been wiped many times off the internet, but there is accreditation given to Ingo Swan that he's the one that found Saddam Hussein in the palace. He told wow. the um, you know soldiers, yeah. this is the tile to lift. Okay, this one will blow you away. It's in Carl Jung's synchronicity book. And if you haven't read that, I highly suggest because it teaches you more about how to access the intuitive power of not trying to make things logical, which is one of the first premises that's presented in the CI document. I love this about this. Niels Bohr said that his son told him, Daddy, you're not thinking. You're merely being logical. And I thought that was a, a brilliant quote to start off the CIA document, which then proposes that the harder you try to make sense out of it with your left hemisphere, the more it pushes you away from the vibrational access to see what's going on. Well, anyway, in the Rhine project, there's 25 cards. Each card has a shape, triangle, circle, equal. There's a machine that shuffles the cards and then they just one at a time they give it out well they gave it to this one person who was remarkable he guessed um an average of 12 out of 25 he hit correctly now the odds of that are one in four hundred thousand. but on one occasion he got it all right he picked all 25 that is a odds of one in 285 trillion for him to do that again but he did that once which no one could believe this guy had tremendous abilities then they took the subject and the card uh, shuffling thing separated by 900 miles and then you know by telephone okay what's the next one next one's a triangle yeah he got it what's the next one circle no but he he did get an average of 12 out of 25 again which is one in 400,000 so they put him literally in 4,000 mile distance because they wanted to know is there influence from the man shuffling the card so they use the machine they want to know if there was distance and made no difference the guy got it the one thing that was most remarkable is they did it 
through the passage of time. They videotaped the cards coming out. They didn't tell the man that they were watching a videotape. They just said, what's the next card? And he said, X. And it came out X, even though it was recorded days ago. So what we know is this ability to remote view, that pretty much proves it, is that he could see across great distances, so that's space. He could see across time because he saw something that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And that was a, it's called the Ryan experiment, and it will make you a believer. I know what makes you a believer is experiencing yeah. these things for yourself. Uh, this book here, can we, uh, can we see that? Uh, Psychic Tracks in the Wilderness, written by uh, Dale E. Graff, who was a, a physics major, and he's the founder and former director of Project Stargate. Now, he talks about Ingo Swan in this book and how, how amazing he was as a psychic, but um, he starts the book explaining that he was very cynical and very sceptical, a, a real, you know, um, traditional scientist, if you like, and this was a project that he shouldn't have taken on because it wasn't his field, and the next thing you know, he's involved in Project Stargate and he's developing psychics for the CIA, and he's totally convinced and totally convincing in explaining the project that he was involved in he doesn't just talk about remote viewing although he does a lot of that and he does it really well he talks about synchronicity too like you were explaining there synchronicity and dreams psychic dreams and how important dreams are it's a fantastic book and that led me on to another book by ingo swan called penetration now that book blows my mind um the idea of men in black was taken from penetration because Ingo Swan tells the story about, um, where, where, where was it? It was a famous university in America where it was set up, um, Stanford, that's where it was. Um, and he was, get, get, he was getting bored of doing these child games of like what's in the next room, what's in the box, etc. And um, Ingo Swan said, I want to test the power of my abilities. So he started to remote view the moon. <laughs> So he was remote viewing the moon, right? And the next thing he says, these guys, these um, men in black, turned up from an unnamed government agency and took him away. They took him away to this underground base, and uh, that's in the book anyway. And then he was hired by the government on the best wages of his life to remote view the moon. Uh, and uh, in the book, he tells you a lot of interesting stories about the moon that you wouldn't normally believe, but it's because his story is corroborated by so many other sources. It's not just his individual story. There's lots of other books saying how talented Ingo Swan was as a psychic. So when you read Penetration, you know it's the whole idea of men in black, uh, aliens coming to Earth and hiding. He talks about it in the book. So yeah, um, the rain project that you uh, were talking about, being able to be done over long distances, well, Ingo Swan did the moon and then he did Saturn. And the things he reported back from Saturn were confirmed a few years later when the probe got there. The stories are neat, but what winds up happening is that once you discover that you have this talent, and we all have the talent, we always pick up the phone and say, I was just thinking about you. Um, as long as you don't immediately dismiss that as nothing, mm -hmm. um, then you start to be able to use it as a tool. If I were to pick up a phone and not know how to answer it, then I would put it away and never pick it up again. The reason why we have this miraculous thing called an iPhone that we can look at the shiny piece of glass, plus press the green thing and talk to someone in Tokyo. Meanwhile, all of these messages are going across this. I could call you on the phone right now and you would get that as easily as you could call your buddy in the mm. uh, desk behind you and he would get that. So think of how many trillions of messages pass through our body mm. or in, in vibrational energy everywhere. And that pales in comparison to the Akashic records because all the Akashic records are and what they're doing in the CIA document is talking about how to access it. Can you give us a, a history of like a brief introduction to the Akashic Records because it's quite an, an esoteric subject. So could you give us a little intro into that? The Akashic Records are known in many different ideologies as basically the database of 
the global knowledge uh, of all humanity, which is actually kind of narrow, what the Akashic Records are, and I basically just call it the hologram, uh, is that you anything that happened or has ever happened goes out into the universe. So, for example, I just clapped my hand. Those sound waves will go out forever and not be diminished like it would be in a still pond. If I drop a pebble in a still pond, you'll see ripples, but they'll eventually die out. The thing about the universe is the only thing that makes any ripple die out is friction and resistance. So in the universe, which doesn't have friction and resistance, these events will go on out forever, whatever the event is. An event is a thought, it's a clap, it's uh, Marilyn Monroe stubbing her toe coming out of the shower. You can pick that up because it happened and it all went out there. So this ability to, let's just put them all together for discussion purposes, remote viewing, out of body experiences and tr time travel. Are they not the ability to see everything? Mm -hmm. Is that not omniscience? If we take out the categories and we just say, Dude can see everything. Are we talking here about um, what's mentioned in the document is about the idea of the finite universe and the infinite universe? I mean, we're in the finite universe by definition, and it has to be moving, whereas the infinite is still. Everything exists in one moment. Everything that's ever happened, everything that ever will happen all existing in one moment in this giant server where all this information is collected from throughout the universe. Is is that what we're tapping into when we practice these esoteric arts like, you know, um, astral projection and remote viewing? Okay, so he does a good job in the document of explaining that, but without a more broad knowledge of what he's saying, it probably won't mean anything. So I will explain that to you. When you call something the finite universe, what does finite mean? It means it's defined. Well, finite is the ability to describe the beginning and the end of events, right? So it's a, it's a bracket. So we have the finite universe, which we can explain through words. We can measure with tape measures. We can yeah. measure with, um, you know, red shifting of stars and saying they're going away from us or whatever it is. Those are things that we can measure, see, and define, which we call the finite universe. In synchronicity, the basic definition of synchronicity as defined by Carl Jung is that it is a causal events which have a very profound meaning. And so that is the undefined universe. And that's why the CIA document is so brilliant. Mm -hmm. Because it says anything that you can define, anything that you can logically explain, anything that we can discuss on a podcast goes in to the left hemisphere. That's the gatekeeper for full brain consciousness. It keeps out the junk. We're bombarded with thousands of messages and advertising. And the left hemisphere has to decide what it's going to find noteworthy. What it typically does is it filters out anything that it thinks it already knows. This is what I love about propaganda, is they give you a definition that you can say, oh, guy's coughing, he must have Omicron. So once they give you that, you then program a groove in your left hemisphere. And the more you rely on that left hemisphere, the more you shut off the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is a creative playground uh, for your possibilities and wonderment of everything. What they do in society is they try to bombard our left hemisphere, our logical cause equals effect, action leads to a reaction. There must be a reason for this. Oh, it's the masks. People aren't wearing masks enough or because science. All of those things are grooved to your left hemisphere, and it's getting old. People are getting sick of being told what 
to groove into their left hemisphere, which is cool about the CIA document. It literally tells you, you can't get to the good stuff until you turn off the left hemisphere really really interesting subject isn't it that the brain's got two parts that are separate there's one side that deals with logic and reason and the other side deals with um intuition and creativity but yet accessing the right side of the brain is difficult and requires some skill or talent and some people have that ability to access the right brain no problem but like you say um that's um a lot of what the control grid does what we experience in our daily life is to uh, keep us away from accessing the right brain they just want us living in the left brain is that's what is that what's coming across in the document it, it is the thing that i found really interesting about the document is it has no mention of the pineal gland um it also has photoreceptors which is wow. amazing in itself so why do you think it has photoreceptors? Because it's enc encased in the brain and the skull, um, and there's no light getting in there whatsoever. I mean, why would you know this tiny gland, which is about that big, have photoreceptors? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? The photoreceptors are to pick up the vibrational energy that our eyes can't see. We cannot see into the infrared. We cannot see into the ultraviolet. It doesn't mean that it's not there. You know, we can't hear below 20 hertz or above 20,000 hertz. Um, but it doesn't mean those sounds aren't there. You blow a dog whistle and your dog comes. So what the pineal gland is, and it's always been called in ancient cultures the third eye, third eye chakra, it is the one that is able to actually punch into the vibrational energy, this holographic uh, ability to view the universe through its vibrational energy, but that only occurs when the left and the right are in sync. Then, now get this, the pineal then has dominion over the two hemispheres, and then that's when the whole thing becomes whole brain convergence. And those rare moments that you've had that, then you can just say, wait, my left side logical side saw this explained it to a man saw a man able to recreate that that's left brain right the right brain goes yeah i'm not surprised but the pineal was the one to see the bigger meaning in it so the um the idea in the documents is they say to achieve this experience uh, as a gateway experience into the other realms that we we have to unify both hemispheres of the brain which they call um, hemisync. And um, once you synchronize both hemispheres of the brain, you're able to access the Akashic records. Like, um, you know, what you're talking about, the infinite. You're able to do it with practice, see into the future, see into the past, you know, um, because that's when the brain is unified. Now they talk about, I think, um, there are four ways in which we can achieve this. Um, one was hypnosis because hypnosis makes the left brain fall asleep so you can access the right brain and which takes things it takes things literally um, the other one um was transcendental meditation and the other one was um biofeedback and the final one was was hemisync but they make special mention though of um, zen buddhism a zen buddhist with 20 years practice is able to access the akashic records and the infinite due to his training and the practice he put in for so long they're able to sit so quietly and basically synchronize the brain i, I know you've been a, a practitioner of zen buddhism for 40 years uh, i think uh, maybe longer but so you have over 20 years experience as a zen master and is that one of the reasons you were drawn to this document and that you've been to you've been able to articulate it in such a way to decipher the code for people like me you know um Tell us a little bit about, about that and uh, your background in Zen. Yeah, so the interesting thing about um, my ability to see things and explain things so clearly is the minute I read it, I knew exactly what it was saying. And I thought, well, how wonderful. Someone's done all this work for me. Um, my introduction to Zen was through martial arts. Uh, there was this karate school where all of their students were winning all of the championships. And I wanted to be one of those really tough guys. And I went to the sensei and he says, you know, why are you here? 
And I said, it's because I, uh, I'm an only child. I moved to this playground. It's tough. I want to be able to beat the shit out of everybody. So he said, great. Come on Saturday at 1, and we'll give you, introduce you to a special class, which, of course, was Zazen meditation. And being 12 years old and all the hormones running and anguish and having to sit in a lotus position uh, for a long time took uh, a lot of anguish and grief until it became like, wait a minute, I want to do this again. And once you learn about how to breathe and how to center yourself, and again, centering is a great way to describe hemisyncing, because what are you doing when you're hemisyncing? You're centering the awareness of the two hemispheres. Um, once I learned how to do that, then there was an incredible calm that came. The thesis of using Zen and martial arts together and why they're winning so many tournaments is because the Zen mind does not react. So when a punch is coming at you, you very peacefully just know how to block it and redirect the energy in the present moment. You don't look for an opening. You don't, because when you're goal oriented and you want to hit the guy in the nose, but his head just moved, now your plans just got changed. So when we are too busy hitting the replay while we're in a fight, we're going to get beaten up. And so that's what Zen and martial arts was all about. But I found the whole thing addicting, and I still do, to be able to get into that art of nothingness, which is what they call Zen. And um, what they call Satori, as uh, Buddha described it, is enlightenment. What is enlightenment? That ability to pick up the Akashic Records. Tell me a little bit about Zazen, the, the, the actual practice, and what somebody would do if they were practicing Zazen. Why is it different to, than traditional meditation? And why did the CIA feel the need to make a distinction between Zen, Buddhist meditation, and every other type of meditation? I mean, what do you think it is that separates it from the rest? Well, in the documents, because they had a ton of evidence knowing that the Zen, boot, you know, the Buddha Zen masters, they had incredible efficacy at remote viewing and at this amazing universal knowledge of these basic truths that we all try to, you know, minimize through social training and, and things, programming like that. But um, in Zen meditation, as compared to, say, other types of meditation, many meditations have a mantra um, where you repeat the same phrase. Now, that's not a bad idea. The problem is, is you're actually still directing yourself. And uh, when, when something is technique-based like that, when I teach Zen meditation, people say, well, how do I know? Am I doing this right? So there's an expectation energy to it. Whereas in Zen meditation, the simplest thing about it is, number one, to understand that it's going to be as boring as hell. And thank God that I had to go through that as a preteen, because if you can get through those years, then you can get through anything. And to be a preteen and like it, you find it incredibly addicting. So it's not technique-based. It's not you put on headphones, because the way that I understand it is that anything that comes in through your ears, eyes, the five senses, yeah, anything that comes in through your five senses is merely here to protect the physical three-dimensional body from harm. We have eyes to see a train coming at us. We have ears to hear an explosion, you know, nose to smell smoke. Um, taste poison is something bad, whatever. Those five senses are not our perception into the Akashic Records. In fact, they're a detriment. So what I find in Zen meditation is to deplete any input from the five senses 
and that constitutes boredom, especially in the way that society has programmed us now. They want us to be constantly connected. They do not want us to have self-reflection. You know, that moment where we get a little bit bored, there's always some digital device competing for our attention. So we don't have these moments of solitude, you know, where we can um, think things through, uh, emotional issues, relationship problems, is that we don't have the time because the digital matrix is constantly trying to keep us looking at the screen one way or another and you know the act of solitude whether that's walking alone or something else it seems as if zen is the art of solitude the art of disconnection so it takes it to a much much deeper level and would you say that um the practice is a natural way to achieve brain synchronization because i know what the cia document is about and they were looking to compete with the russians who had developed their own psychic unit and the cia thought shit we got to get on this and uh, they discovered the monroe institute which was run by robert monroe and he was teaching people the gateway experience um because he was an expert after having you know uh, 20 years of uh, out-of-body experiences so they, they went to his institute and they found out that it actually worked and then they started sending in the army because Monroe had developed these binaural beats, which allow frequencies to bring the brain to synchronization. Now, is Zen a natural way to do that rather than the assisted way that um, Hemisync does with binaural beats? Well, the thing about binaural beats is, um, and I know what it is, and I'm not a huge uh, proponent of it, um, because what happens in Zen meditation is you have to let go of all expectations. It's not about cause and effect. It's not about if I take up Zen meditation, I'll be more enlightened. It's not like I'm going to move to an ashram in India and forget about the me that everyone hates. I'm going to come out of there. I'm going to have a six pack and I'm going to have, you know, just money making ideas. People are so interested in solutions. Well, where do you get that? We're taught that. So what happens in when you buy a Monroe course and you put on the tapes and you hear the binaural beats, yes, that's very effective in a hypnotic way of boring the left hemisphere, which can be done manually. I'm talking about a training program that uses no weights or equipment, just your own body. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. basic, yeah, like yeah, yeah. let's keep out the five senses. Mm -hmm. And once we keep the five senses off, the left hemisphere no longer wants to play this stupid game. It wants to do Minecraft. It wants to do, it yeah. wants to find out about, you know, Will Smith and whatever it is. Well, the irony is, is that in Minecraft, um, it's a simulation of the simulation. And, you know, you're the player and uh, there's somewhere in the server, somewhere in the cloud that is creating this world that you are operating in and you're in control of. But, you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, you don't have to play Minecraft to create a, and control a, a simulation. If you know how to hack the Matrix, you can go into the Akashic Records yourself and maybe change the server from source, you know, change reality like uh, some gurus or, or yogis are able to do. Well, let's talk about reality, because that's a really good point. We talk about reality. We talk about a reality that the left side says, I've got proof that this works. I've got a scientific basis. I've got peer-reviewed articles, and that is what one calls reality. But really, what is reality? Is it something that happens within the five uh, senses? And this is why my reality is not coming from words I read, because that would be eyes. It doesn't come from listening to podcasts. Sorry, podcast listeners. But um, you do get a lot of like direction and clarity. But the real information comes when you're lulled into what they call tapping out mm -hmm. um, in the CIA document. When you can get your frequency, vibrational frequency to go into lower and lower beats until the crossover. It's called a plank, isn't it? That the idea that there's a wave and at the top of the wave, there's a moment of stillness as it comes back down uh, to the bottom of the wave. And it's only a, a tiny, tiny millisecond. 
and I think if I was reading it right is that that's when in that moment of stillness is when we can pop through into the other realms no that's not where we pop through we pop through into other realms what they call the clicking out is when your frame frame rate goes so slow that it pre approaches flatness yeah. flatness is where we get the good stuff and okay. here's why uh one thing that they got wrong in the cia document was the nature space and time they try to describe it as a torus and and all those other things and they try to make forced conclusions to make the report sound good if i were to say really what is the real nature of the universe the nature of the universe is i think i asked you this last time how many dimensions would you say that the universe has well one dimension would be a straight line what a dimension is is it is a dimension of measure length height depth Right, that's our three dimensions, right? So then they go on to describe four, five, six, and they try to do it mathematically. It doesn't really work because they're all wrong. You cannot measure the universe. They say it's infinite, but no one can prove it. Um, the real nature of the universe is that it has zero dimensions. And that's the part that is so hard for us who like to take tape measures and that's the width and this is the weight and that was four years ago and 16 days and 32 minutes that we got married. Those are all the constructs of man trying to bracket the transfer of energy so that they can report it to others. What happens in uh, the universe in the Akashic records is the simple nature of the universe is as we all know, it has no beginning, no end. It has infinite width, infinite depth. It's infinitely old. Okay. Doesn't that also coincide with something that has no dimensions? A dimension is something that you can measure. So if it has no dimensions, then now everything makes sense because when you try to say, can I look into the future? Can I look into the past? The interesting thing about a zero dimensional universe is it is all accessible right here and right now through holographic viewing. See, people say that um, the universe, because it has no beginning and no end, so say it had no left and no right, how would you know if it moved? If it has no sides, you can't measure the universe, right? How do you know that it even moved? So how do you know that it had an element of time? Because an element of time is the bracketing of an event that began. Time is movement. It's a shift of energy that we can report through our measuring protocols, whether it's kilograms or pounds or, you know. And that's one thing that I found so humorous about Stephen Hawking's book, uh, a, a Brief History of Time. He got it completely wrong, and I could not understand how someone who is so, um, you know, decorated and, and kind of pompous talks about anything that actually ever happened is only within the event horizon. The event horizon is the things that we can see within the speed of light. Now, yes, that works for observable physics, but not theoretical physics or, you know, um, things that we can measure and observe. And that's, the, that's where it gets interesting, where we have to give up this idea of a scientific five-dimensional measurable reportable, peer-reviewed, typable. We have to get rid of all of those comments because that's all hearsay. The things that you experience through your brief moments of tapping into the Akashic Records. That is true knowledge, isn't it? And it's, um, it's not a belief. It's a transition from belief to knowledge because knowledge is experiencing it for yourself. And nobody can take that away from you. Exactly. And belief is a definition of a falsity. If I were to say, I believe that my daughter is mine, 
I've got a problem, don't I? Isn't that me admitting that I don't know? So when people believe, they're just admitting that they don't really know. I have people who ask me, how do I get there? I have a very interesting story just before the lockdown. Um, I was stopped at a, a stoplight and there's this popular restaurant on, on the main road. And I looked over and it was all completely boarded up. And I thought, God, that is really weird. So I got on my phone while the light was stopped and tried to look up news for that restaurant. There was no news. The light turned green. We started driving, and I looked over, and all the plywood was gone. And I thought, okay, I did not imagine that. I literally was there, and I literally saw that. What the hell was that? So I pulled over into the parking lot, and then I breathed. There's a very beautiful breathing technique that comes in Zen meditation. I can explain that to you before we're done. Um, I went into that space, breathed into it, envisioned what I just saw, but not envisioned it with my mind's eye, my vibrational energy. And when I got out of the car, parking lot was empty. All the stores were boarded up. I walked out onto the highway. Not a car could be seen. And then I called up the mother of my kids, and I said, um, yeah, I'm going to be moving uh, to my ranch. And she said, why are you moving to the ranch? It's for sale. You're just going to have to move back out. I said, because it has refrigeration. It has storage. We have a playground for the kids. And she goes, why is that important? I said, because they're going to lock down society. Now, this was January 11th. I journal everything. And um, I called my buddy, and he helped me move. And he goes, why are you moving from your office to, to your you know, ranch? And I said, because they're going to shut down society. In March of 2020, exactly that thing happened, just as I was completely unpacked. And he's seen me do that a few times before, like the fire at my house. Um, I put everything in a fireproof safe because I could see it, and I knew it. But I knew it in a way that you would picture Noah and Noah's Ark. It's like, that's a madman. He's building this ark because he's convinced the world's going to flood, and it happens. Madness is what society does to keep us good, little, productive soldiers. What was um, your experience in Canada like during the last two years? I mean, how did you manage to maintain Zen in such crazy, insane times? It wasn't crazy, and it was one of the most amazing um, periods I'd ever had. I'd never been happier until the lockdown started. I mean, as you know, I write movies, and so nothing like solitude for me. Um, and I prepared myself. We had a lot of food. Um, my children had the playground. But I had to learn how to cook. I'd never cooked before. And so the kids were like going, wow, Dad made spaghetti. You live in Canada, correct? Yeah, um, and we witnessed from England, I, I don't know if what we were looking at was the truth, but we witnessed the transformation of Canada from what appeared to be anyway, um, you know, this quiet, unassuming common law jurisdiction into this form of ugly authoritarian dictatorship in which we saw the whole trucker movement, which was fantastic, but in the end it was just aggressively stamped out by Trudeau the tyrant. I mean, what was it like for you in Canada during that period? I mean, did you feel a, a shift in the whole political spectrum of Canada? And, you know, has that improved at all? Uh, it has, and I saw a shift in momentum. Um, unfortunately, in Canada right now, if you have a flag, that is a sign of anarchy. Can you believe that? My daughter, like, brought the Canadian flag and some other things to school, and she was disallowed to have it because the flag itself is a sign of anarchy. And this really came from the truckers' convention, and they all had flags because they wanted, you know, their Canada back. So um, things have improved in terms of Canadians not thinking that their neighbor is an uninvolved idiot. Um, what we started to see is that um, people, when they're pushed hard enough, they will pick up a rock or, or a brick, and they will throw it through a window. So... Um, and I don't think you're old enough to remember the Berlin Wall coming down, but it's just like what's happening right now. Because if you remember what happened in that 
sequence of events, President Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. He didn't take it down right away, and he kind of took it, Gorbachev took it under advisement. But during that time that he was thinking about it, and the world's greatest superpower is telling them to take down the wall, a handful of individuals jumped over the wall. And there are soldiers with machine guns instructed to shoot to kill anybody who jumped over the wall. These boys jumped over, did not get shot. And so everyone was waiting. What is going to happen? They didn't get shot. Ten guys came over. A hundred guys came over. This is before uh, Gorbachev called an end to perestroika. And then it was like thousands, and they had mallets, and they were whacking it down. And it couldn't have been like an hour or two hours later. I saw pictures of, like, East Berliners wearing the battle helmets of the West Berlin soldiers, and they're smoking cigarettes together. So what I saw was people need a moment where they can feel like it's okay now to protest. And that's what happened with the, the, the trucker's convoy. Yeah, I remember the Berlin Wall quite well. And my mother was, um, she was making a film in uh, West Berlin with Mika Karasmaki, the brother of Aki Karasmaki, two Finnish auto directors. And uh, I think I must have been about 10 or 11 at the time. I'm 45 now. And I got to go to Berlin to go and visit my mum on, uh, on the set of the film. We stayed in West Berlin, obviously. Um, and we stayed in the Kapinski Hotel, really beautiful grand hotel. And it was fantastic and, you know, it was great. And she said, do you want to go through Checkpoint Charlie to visit East Berlin? And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, whatever. I mean, that was only 10 or 11. Um, but I can still remember it to this day. And it was probably one of the most intimidating experiences going through Checkpoint Charlie. And um, all the Soviet soldiers all had the, the typical Eastern European kind of look. That They always look angry. Um, I do remember this really heavy-duty military-style Checkpoint with checking your passport and all that kind of thing. And um, Checkpoint Charlie was the border between West Berlin and East Berlin. And it, I remember us going through, and it was a long time ago, you know, but um, and it was everything you would imagine Soviet brutal architecture to be, you know, and it was all this weird, strange architecture. And I'll never forget all of the cars. All of the cars were exactly the same. I mean, do you ever remember Larders, like this square boxy car that we used to have over here? But uh, there, every single car was the same. It was weird. I mean, it was total communism, you know? We owned up in this restaurant or a cafe or something like that, and uh, sitting next to us was this old Russian woman, like a, a Russian babushka, you know? Um, and my mum brought a lunchbox for me and her, I think, in case we couldn't get food. <laughs> and um, I remember opening the lunchbox... And I had, uh, you know, some beautiful fruit, uh, some uh, sausages that we'd nick from the Buffy and the Kabinsky. And I remember the woman sitting next to me and she just stared at the food. She stared at the fruit and she said um, she hadn't seen fruit in 30 years. Right. So we were just like, there you go, lady, you can have that. You know, and it was just really, uh, it was really eye opening. Um, what those people had to go through, really. Yeah, me too. And I went shortly after the wall fell, went through Checkpoint Charlie, went into these provisional grocery stores with empty shelves, and the lives of everybody was so barren and hopeless and 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 desolate. But then on, you know, as you know, he stayed at the Kapinski, so mm. um, there'd be a Four Seasons Hotel, there'd be Ferraris driving around. I mean, West Berlin was just tremendously successful. Yeah. And I don't know if you've been back, but that area, the 100-yard um, no-man's land, is the prime real estate of that area, and as is East Berlin. Uh, but the larger point is is that I witnessed a coup. But what really gave me a ton of belief that none of this shit, okay, between you and the Akashic Records, you'll figure this out, but same group as the Romans, They've been, it's the same group that fed the Christians to the tigers. It's the same group that, that vies for control of the entire planet. And that's not going to happen this time. Is that what you're seeing right now? Because what we see here is the Great Reset, you know, and it's all the same figures all seem to be moving in the same direction. 
you know, you've got Trudeau and Macron and all these people who were supposedly uh, young leaders of the World Economic Forum. And it seems to be moving into this dystopian future that's completely inhuman or even transhuman. I mean, are you seeing those things? Do you think they'll fail? It will fail. And um, so when you say that we're seeing, I'm going to challenge you and ask you, sure. are you seeing this through mainstream news, right? A mixture of uh, mainstream news and alternative news or, or the internet. I mean, I don't watch mainstream news. I watch the internet, but even even through those channels, it, it appears that he, he is the main subject. Probably just a puppet. I mean, probably just a distraction. But I get the feeling that we're going through some kind of um, some kind of transition, or it's a, a forced attempt to take us through some kind of civilizational transition. Well, it's been here for years, and I actually met Klaus Schwab in St. Petersburg. So wow. I, I don't know how I bumped into all of these people, but I bumped into all of them, Bill Gates, and shook hands with Jeff Bezos. And I don't know why this happens, but I just happened to, you know be intersecting with these interesting people. And the thing about <clears throat> Klaus Schwab is we've known about him forever, or I've known about him forever, and I've known about World Economic Forum as long as it's existed. And what's happening is that you'll read a thing called Agenda 2030, and they're in a real hurry to get to 2030. Um, complete monitoring, surveillance, tracking, behavior, uh, control through, you know, radiation and, and all these things. And you wonder why is the hurry to a certain number 2030? And it's if you can perceive they're speeding up and getting quite sloppy about it. One could say it looks like it's heading in a certain direction, but I could argue back that it's a pretty screwed up time for the bad guys. I mean, Bill Gates didn't want to get divorced. Um, you know, the Queen didn't want to have Meghan Markle go against her or her son get caught with Epstein. And all. so it's, it's going very badly. The tide is turning, and that's the operative part about why this is important, why the CIA document leads you uh, to understand the depth of why we're going to be really okay. Um, what's happening is... I think you've heard of the age of Aquarius and the shift between Pisces to Aquarius. Yeah. Now, that's not a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. That's actually extremely important distinction to make because what happens in um, an astrological age has nothing to do with astrology. It happens to do where the where what you see when you look straight up when you're at the North Pole. And so because the you know, Earth spins so quickly, like a top, it does have a wobble, and it and that little wobble circles <clears throat> the astrological signs every 24,000-ish years. In the age of Pisces, which was the previous age, there was very little star energy over us and, and shining down upon us. So we had very little pineal gland activity for those of us who were able to perceive that kind of vibrational energy from the universe. There's not only very little of it, um, but that was the age of monotheism. So there were gurus. There was uh, Dalai Lama. There was, there was the Pope. We relied on the Holy See to see things that we as mere mortals could not see because that was the age of monotheism. Was the age of Aries, which was polytheism. So you had the god of, you know, Icarus flew too close to the sun, you know, Atlas holding up the world. A very, very different type of energy. When we moved into Aquarius, Aquarius is like being in a helicopter hovering over Manhattan. You've got an insane density of stars, supernovas, um, just so much light energy beaming down on us. And this is why you know, many people are feeling a shift. They're feeling like they've never felt before, like society doesn't work. Anyone, and I don't know when you know when the shift happened, it was December 21 of 12. That's the date where the Aztec and the Mayan calendars both ended. And people thought, oh my God, this is the end of the world because two disparate civilizations 
called this day the end. Mm -hmm. People were killing themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't the end. That was the end of the age of Pisces. And so people get all of these things wrong. You know, they go, well, why is the secondary symbol of Christianity the fish? And why is it in Matthew, whatever, 24, 17, Jesus says, I will teach a man to fish. And you see people on Instagram fishing, and they're quoting the scripture. That's not what it's about. Jesus was a person who initiated people into the age of Pisces. And that's what he meant. In the age of Pisces, we will worship one God, not many gods. Okay, so as we come into Aquarius, we don't need gurus anymore. I mean, would you say that the age of Aquarius and uh, this talk of a great awakening that we hear coming through the culture, um, could this be when uh, humanity learns to synchronize both hemispheres of the brain and activate the pineal gland? And that's where the connection comes from to God. And that's why uh, the CIA document is so important. Is that kind of what you're alluding to? Tiny bit different. Um... <clears throat> Anyone born after December 21 of 12, they're characteristically different than us. They won't follow rules. They won't um, adhere to institutions. They, will, um, they won't be rebellious. They'll just, what the hell are you talking about paying taxes? Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, um, the way that I like to explain it is that there's a difference between the world and the earth. People say, this is the richest man in the world, not the richest man on earth, because there's a fundamental difference. The world is borders, governments, taxes, currencies, seasons, end of the month, um, time constraints. That is the world. The earth is sycamore trees, babbling brooks, um, you know, tulip gardens, that is the earth. And so what's going to happen is, is there was a group of people who forever have tried to create this super race, this global empire of Aryan or whatever they are. They've tried to create a control over the entire globe so that everyone does what they want to do. They're also very mindful that Aquarius is rising. And when Aquarius rises, those kids who are born in 12, guess how old they are in 2030? Cool. They're 18. This is why they're in a rush to get yeah. this shit clamped uh, down. Okay. So as we move towards um, 2030, because they need to hit certain dates and certain times in order to maintain their control. I mean, we're seeing a massive ramp up in... Uh, EMF poisons and digital toxicity coming from all angles. It feels like it's almost almost impossible to avoid this invisible enemy or this invisible rainbow of of frequencies that are man made that are not coming from natural parts of the universe and, and that have an effect on our, our psyche, our soul, on our well being. And I, I'm guessing that this is part of the control grid to keep our consciousness dulled and uh, dumbed down as uh, it's part of controlling the left brain so that we can't access the right brain without a lot of work. And, you know, what are your thoughts on how we can combat the EMF bombardment? And tell me about your research on that. It's more about being able to understand that nothing that man can make can overpower the vibrational energy of the universe. So that's the one thing that one could rely on and just say anything synthetic <clears throat> is created to block me from that universal light energy. Um, and that light energy is that basically vibrational stillness. So as a person who practices Zen, as a person who wears Shanghai, like so much of it, um, you are able to take synthetic energy. And when I talk about synthetic energy, anything that's made by man, it kills. If you think about it, it's 100% true. Um, electricity is not toxic. You read uh, Invisible Rainbow, 
and you know that you know it's direct current, it has no EMF effect on people. It's the alternating current that really wipes you out. And um, you know, once they figure that out, they're like, oh my gosh. And this is the part that is challenging. Those of us who are ascending in our ability to perceive light energy and the holographic viewing of the universe's nature through our pineal gland, we're the most susceptible to getting attacked by synthetic energy. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who have the floodgates open to which all the toxins can come in. And that's the important thing, is to understand that synthetic energy in a quantum basis has what's called a negative spin. I call it synthetic spin. So whether it's glyphosate or it's alternating current, you know, the current in one direction has a magnetic field, if you remember physics, of perpendicular in, in the direction of the current. The problem is, is when it goes backwards, then now that's completely against the nature of all of us. Or, you know, concert A being <clears throat> tuned up to 440 hertz rather than the 432 hertz that is harmonious with nature. All of those things, once you know about them, then you keep away from those sources and then you practice living in the present and then there's an incredible happiness that, that just kind of washes over you. Uh, a lot of people have asked me about, you know, my health and why I'm so healthy. And I've, I've always wanted to ask, have you ever met a really, really happy person and noticed that they don't get sick very often? A lot of the sickness that we get is because we're unhappy or we're worried or we're, you know, we're stressed. And all of these things come in through the news, which comes in through the five dimensions. So the more time that you spend outside of the five dimensions, and I love that you love how to read uh, all, of, all of this stuff, and it's fantastic, but don't let that filter your experience into your own personal travel of being able to see into the other frequencies if that makes sense in a previous conversation you told me about it which is that black stone you have around your neck currently um i thought it was amazing stuff and has an amazing history of where it comes from can you give us a little bit of insight into that it uh, comes from a, a meteor and it exists in only one place and that is in a lake very very western russia um, called Karelia. and these rocks are almost 100% carbon, but a different type of carbon. Sorry to interrupt, so so, um, so let me get this right. So there's only one place in the world that Shungai comes from, and that's in Western Russia, but it's from a meteor. Is that confirmed? It's a meteor lake. Oh yes, this is well known. You can look it up and, and there's a ton of history on this. It was, um, I think it was Peter the Great, he was the Tsar of Russia, he, uh, got reports that all these people that lived around this lake um, were youthful, happy, healthy. But the thing that really got it for them was there were these people that were working in this copper mine that got incredibly sick. And when they went into the lake, uh, they were instantly cured. The water in the lake cured them of their ailments. So he went over there. Uh, I think, yeah, it was Peter the Great. Uh, he went over there and rode his horse and, you know, got into the lake and just said, my gosh, this is, gonna, this is an amazing place. He built a spa there, and then he directed his soldiers to take a dunk in the lake before they went out to battle, and they found all of these amazing properties. So it's well known. It's very hidden. Um, I'm not one that goes around to promote Shanghai a lot. Um, because, so what Shungai does is it is um, fullerene in composition. What a fullerene is, or a buckyball, is 60 carbon atoms that are interlocked into something like the shape of a soccer ball. Soccer yeah. ball, you know, has a bunch of hexagons. In that locked up shape of carbon, um, it produces a, a number of unique properties. And first, 
to explain that, we have to understand the properties of carbon. So carbon is a hexagon, it's six-sided, but it's very interesting because there's double bonds and single bonds and double bonds and single bonds, and they alternate. But they don't just alternate, they literally switch signs like a, a marquee on Times Square. So what happens is <clears throat> inside the carbon, you've got this spin, which mm -hmm. happens to be universal spin energy mm -hmm. in um, harmony with nature. Now, carbon itself has a very, what they call, bond affinity. It wants to suck onto everything and create a sugar molecule or CO2 or, a, you know, uh, DNA. The basis of all Roll life yeah. depends on carbon because of its ability to interchange locking parts. So what happens is when you glue a bunch of these carbons together, and they can't suck up anything else because all of their ends are busy, what happens is it's nothing but a spin generator, and it spins positive quantum energy in the same energy as the universe is, in contrast to anything that is synthetic that spins in the opposite direction. Now, this is all known. Uh, it's, it's talked about an invisible rainbow. He talks about alternating current and how those EMFs are so destructive to our tissues and everything like that. So I like to think of it as <clears throat> an unspinner. So you've got all of this reverse yeah. energy spin coming in because we're all electricity. Yeah. And it's coming and bombarding us in the wrong direction. We're defenseless against that. But when you have this touching your chakras, what happens is any of that reverse spin energy becomes corrected, just like um, noise reduction headphones. Noise reduction headphones sends out an opposite wavelength to the noise so that they cancel each other. So let's tie up this loose end on the CIA. So the CIA run this project in which they developed a psychic unit and it went on for, I think, uh, 10 years or more. Officially, they said, okay, that's the end of this and we're not going to be using psychics anymore, even though they were highly effective. And uh, they give us the impression that Project Stargate was closed. However, if the CIA was getting so much success through psychics like, um, like Ingo Swan and, and all the others, why would the end it? I mean... And if they haven't ended it, what does that that mean? That they've been doing this project secretly for the, the last 20 years. And if so, how good are they at it now? I mean, they must be well-practiced in these arcane arts and allow people to and allow people to remote view into our lives, to time travel. And, you know, is there an actual group of people who are able to do this and change events or the course of history? In some form, it can't stop. Um, but it's not used to weaponize soldiers. It's used to come up with strategies to attenuate the power of the rising awareness. And so it, it becomes more like, well, wait a minute. You know, we know the pineal is the key to everything. So we need to calcify that through fluoridation, through synthetics. Mm -hmm. um, we know that you must have left brain coherence in order for them to vibrate in sync so that the pineal can take dominion over the entire uh, brain. That's one thing about this document. It calls hemisync. <clears throat> I call it full brain convergence. Because mm -hmm. it's when these two are together, that's when the pineal can happen. So what they're doing is they're trying to study new ways of attenuating the ability to tap into that. Because once, just imagine if the whole world could see everything that was going on. I mean, do you think it's important for people to practice these skills? Because I believe everybody has the capacity to do it. So, you know, if the CIA or the Russians or the KGB are still practicing these psychic powers behind the scenes, do you think it's important that we practice them ourselves, like we practice yoga or practice karate or Zen? You know, so we've got some idea of what's going on behind the curtain and, and we've got some defense. It's all coming out together as a collective. Mm. And it's really interesting. I hear this term called the collective conscious 
um, and it's, you know, we're all regrouping. That's not what's happening. What's happening is we're all starting to access the Akashic Records, the vibrational movements at any time in the universe, which of course happens instantaneously right now in the present. So um, is it important to do anything deliberately with the goal to be more aware of what the bad guys are up to? My answer would be straight out no. Because in the age of Aquarius, cause and effect are replaced by synchronicity. Um, remember, the definition of synchronicity is an a-causal effect that leads to profound circumstances. You don't know the meaning of why that weird thing happened. Um, I don't know if you know the story, but there was this woman, and Young is the one who quotes this, took a picture of her son in 1914. <clears throat> the war broke out, and so she never took the film in for processing. She took a picture of her daughter two years later, and when she got the picture back, it was a double exposure of the picture of her son and her daughter two years later. This is to then say the film wound up in the... Um, flow of product that would then be sold in the store, then this woman goes up and says, hi, I'd like a roll of film, it happens to be the same role that had a picture of her son. So this is the beauty of that phenomenon, and it's very, very famous if you, if you read Carl Jung's Synchronicity, is that things of like vibrational energy especially in the age of Aquarius, will find each other. So you don't have to say, fuck, where was that roll of film? Oh, if it would only show up if I go to that store, take a picture and see it, then it'll come back. Cause and effect doesn't work in Aquarius. The biggest thing that we can do right now for our own emotional sanity is to give up expectation energy. Why can't I get that promotion? Why won't that girl go out with me? How come I can't see the truth, but those people can see it? Why do I have a gut and other people look so good? Everything in society has taught us to ignore this thing. Picture Buddha, biggest gut in the world, and he's got his hands up and his big earlobes, and he's got a smile when he's experiencing Satori. That's because you need the diaphragm greatly expanded in order for you to let that flow pipe come in. But see, everything society teaches you, stick your gut in, you look fat. It's mm -hmm. like <laughs> everything that they teach you brings you away from that meditational um, plugging in of the energy of the universe, the universal light energy. Okay, I, I think this is a good point to uh, segue into picking you up on what you said you were going to show us earlier about, um, you know, the Zen breathing technique. So picture that you have a third horizontal lung underneath your belly button. You've got your two lungs, and you have the third horizontal What we do is turn off all the lights, make sure that it's soundproof, and then just breathe into that third lung only. Have no sounds, have no distractions, nothing to come into the five senses. Not too hot, not too cold. And um, helps to take one of these stones, put it on your navel, and feel it rise and flow. You know, I've done, I've gone um, to the ocean, and if you hear the ocean waves, it sounds like breathing. It goes as the wave crashes. You breathe in synchronicity, or synchronized with that wave flow. Boom, you are right there. I mean, if you're lucky enough to live at a beach, go there and synchronize your breathing with rise and the crashing of the waves you'll sound just like them it'll sound like you're actually creating that sound for all of nature to um, hear and that truly is 
you becoming in harmony with nature. So um, it's not allowing anything to come in through the five senses and simply breathing into that third lung below you. And for as long as you can. And don't get mad at yourself. Don't go, oh, I'm thinking about my bills. I'm thinking about that. That's all just static electricity discharging. When you go to bed and you, you, know, you have dreams, people go, well, what do these dreams mean? It's like I saw a seagull fly and land on a telephone pole and it started to talk or whatever. You saw a seagull land on a telephone pole, but that was just static electricity. As your brain starts to power down, it goes and you see these random events. While your left brain is still in logic mode, action, reaction, cause and effect, you're like, going, why did the seagull land on there? And then before you fall into deep sleep, you start to create narratives, right? So don't feel bad when you're having not the results that you wish you had because the global part of it is to give up all expectation energy whatsoever. When you give up expectation energy, then you live in this exact moment. And that's where the power comes from. So just to wrap up, I've been trying to see that badge on your shirt for the entire conversation. That looks awesome. Um, can you come closer to the camera uh, so the audience can see what it is? Is it the Wuhan Market Bat Cafe? <laughs> can I go and get a cup of bat? You know, is that a bit of merch that you've made yourself or what's that? Just as a joke. I mean, uh, me and my girlfriend came up with it. We uh, actually made brilliant. a website. <laughs> yeah. We have a website called Wuhan Bat Cafe. Dot com um, and it's and it's got all this but it's it's just about how stupid it is for yeah. us to think that a chinese guy ate a bat and led to the end of civilization yeah. well with what mass formation psychosis has uh, has taught me in the last two years they need the stories to be as absurd as possible in order for the cultists to accept them you know and um this whole bat story it's a classic example Oh God! Um, so listen, it's um, it's been a fantastic conversation as always with you. Uh, if our audience want to find you online, where can they go? Uh, Verifiedshungai.com, and then I'm on Instagram as uh, Gary Fong YLW, um, and those are pretty much the only places I can be. What's the What's the Wuhan one again? Wuhan Bat Cafe. Okay. Well, I'll put all the links in the description below. Um, so just before we finish, uh, what future projects are you working on at the moment? I mean, what's hot for Fong? <laughs> what's up next? I mean, what are you working on? I'm working on a movie about Vanessa Williams right now, okay. a biopic. And um, just an amazing story about a woman who got completely defrocked by society for having nude photos uh, exposed from when she was 18. She was Miss America and then completely disgraced. I love the juxtaposition of today's awareness that in order to get famous, you release nudes. Whereas back in the late 80s, that would was, kill you. It would, it would kill you. So um, it's a fascinating story. She's, you know, sold more records than Whitney Houston and hmm. been in movies with Schwarzenegger and all that. But almost nobody knows about her today. And I think it's a shame that that's not a larger story. Um, she was the first black Miss America and then all of a sudden became the Just most disappears. humiliated, yeah. first to ever uh, resign over a scandal. And now we live in a world of scandals, you know, yeah. the Me Too moves and things like that. So, Well, I look forward to seeing that, Gary. Good luck with that endeavor. Um, let's pick this up again in the future when uh, we want to go deeper into the esoteric nature of reality and what other stories lie behind the curtain and i look forward to it thanks a lot gary for your time i really appreciate it thanks